crowd out there is like an incredible crowd like that loves you and yeah. like you know I, I always say like these crown things are like a meet and greet on t times 10 you know because yeah. the people are right yeah. there and like my job is to like tell the story with you and like yeah. really get people insight into where you at so yeah, man. I'm honored that you took it, the time bro make me look good baby yes sir <laughs> Respect, baby. Yeah. yes sir yeah. Yeah. without further ado man the legendary R. Kelly Kells, man. Let's talk to Kells, man. Now, nah, let's talk about, um, you know, Black Panties' 12th album, man. They're yeah, excited. Thanks, man. I think, I think a couple of people in here copped it. They got that. Look, they're holding it up. Okay, that's what's up. Okay. <laughs> no, and a lot, a, lot, a lot has been made about, you know, the title. Obviously, it's, it's a provocative title, whatever. But like, yeah. talk to me even about your process. Like, Shh, let's settle down, settle down a little bit. Shh, he's right here, he's right, he's staying yeah, all night. Yeah. Let's just chill. Kells is here. Okay, relax. Let's, let's, let's listen. No, but with this album, like, I know you're, you're such a machine that you make so much music. Like, I, I'm curious of when you felt like, when you were making music and making songs that, okay, now I'm finally ready, that this feels right. Black Panties is, is, is taking form, like, and I really want to make this record. Like, this feels like the right time. Well, it was, you know, after doing Love Letter and Love Letter 2, and, you know, thank you. After doing those two albums, you know, it was time to pretty much get back to the sexual R. Kelly, the R. Kelly that got me into the game in the first place, yeah. because I know those fans was out there and they was waiting on it, you know, because everywhere I go, I couldn't go nowhere, man, without somebody saying, man, we're gonna make another baby making album, you know? So, <laughs> and we gotta my, make some babies, girls. Yeah. Well, I got three kids myself off my 12 play album. Yeah, so, so, you know, I, I, re I related to them right away. I said, yeah, I gotta get my ass back in the studio and do a, uh, baby making album, you know. So, we so what certain songs were you making that you felt like, okay, it's starting to take shape? That this feels like this is this is a full body of work. Like when you was in the lab, like when did it feel? Like well, leg shaking right? was the first song I wrote during the, uh, you know. That's the Ludacris. Ludacris is on there. Yeah, yeah, and I decided to put Luda on it. You know what I'm saying? But that was the first song I did for the uh, Black Panties album. And then you know? it just followed that way. Yeah, you know, and then I did the uh, uh, song called, actually, it was called Black Panties. And um, so I just started, it inspired me to just keep on going, you know what I'm saying? Because I would bring girls in the studio, guys, some of the fellas, and I let them sit around. Every song I would do, I would let them sit around and listen to it. We take some drinks, smoke some stogies and some other things, you know what I'm saying? And then <laughs> we get into it, you know what I mean? And then yeah. I was like, look at everybody head bobbing and. You know, and I'd be like, okay, this is one of those ones that's going to go on the album. That's how I basically cho chose the songs. Yeah. Yeah. And it's real explicit. Like, a lot of these joints is like, you know, you got to... <laughs> hey, man, I mean, shit. No, but even more, like, it seems a little more even explicit than, than 12 Play. Like, But I think it's explicit classic. You know, it's yeah. sexual classy. You know what I'm saying? I think it's an album that's going to be around for a while, just like 12 Play, man. It's like, it was, it's, it's forever, you know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm expecting. Black panties to be, you know. I mean, cause it was just as long as women are gonna be wearing black panties, black panties will be around. You know? <laughs> it's funny you always go back to twelve play. Like a lot of artists, they'll make like that that first classic record, right? Mm -hmm. And it, like that was your first solo album, obviously, twelve play. Yeah. And sometimes they feel like you know they get defined by that and they're uncomfortable with it. You seem to embrace it. Like it was obviously an important record, but you you have no problem like paying homage to it and you know. Right. Well, sex is how we all got here. 
Right. Everybody in here because somebody was married. Yeah. Some of us here because somebody met in the club and went to a hotel that night. <laughs> to an R. Kelly song. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think I think what's what's different about you is that you're able to incorporate you know humor with it too. Like you, yeah. you're, you're in on the joke. Like yeah, you, man. like why is that important to kind of also convey that? So even if it gets kind of raunchy, there's still like some humor to it. Yeah, because you know I was always you know the house clown man. You know coming up, I would always make up songs and rhymes and stuff and just ha and have my family cracking up. My mom was a singer, you know, but she would sing Gladys Knight and, you know, Aretha Franklin songs and stuff. And, and I would just joke a lot, you know, d and coming up. And when I got my music, my record deal, and I got musically inclined and my gifts start to develop, I started incorporating that in there. Like when you see a movie, man, and you see some somebody get blown up or shot three times or whatever, then they'll show you another scene where it kind of breaks that ice, you know, it kind of settles you in or whatever, but that's all, you know, like feeling on your booty. I've always wanted to do comedy. <laughs> you like that feeling on yeah, your booty? You know, yeah, that booga, 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 when I do that, it's like, okay, I want them to feel something between their legs, but still laugh at the booga, booga, booga. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying booga, 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 but I'm really meaning something else with my mouth. Like, yeah. it's that type of thing. So do you think... <laughs> So do you think it's a, it's a thing of like, is it, do you almost switch your audience because your audience obviously is very devoted to you, like do you almost like to like, like, like shock them a little bit and like connect to them on the ride? Well, I feel like as long as I keep it real and, you know, you know, and give the ladies what uh, they thinking, but I'm saying it, you know what I'm saying, and uh, I think I'm going to be in the business for a very long time because that's just keeping it real. You've been, you been in the business a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Talk a little bit about like a lot of people have seen you now with Lady Gaga, right? You're doing some things. You seen him with Lady Gaga? Yeah. <laughs> you guys have made like some provocative content already. Like, talk about your musical connection to her. Like, why why did it kind of go there when you when you met her? Like, you know, because I'm sure you probably didn't know her for a while. Like, why do you think that you guys connected so strong? Like, you made the whole thing with at the at the first at SNL. Mm -hmm. You had a great performance. Mm -hmm. AMAs, you had a great performance. Yeah. I heard there's like a provocative video that's on the way. Like, talk a little bit about that connection you, you have with Gaga and, and art you're creating with her. Well, first of all, I, you know, I got to keep it real. You know, she, she, before I met her, I felt like she was a sexy girl because she was, the thing she would do on stage and they had the dress up thing. And, you know, she's really into her, her style. You know, she's locked into her character yeah. and she don't give a damn about what nobody say about it. You know what I'm saying? So I love her for that right off the bat. It's, you know, it's weird, but like, sort of like with the Bulls, when Dennis Rodman came to the Bulls, he was just do what he wanted to do. But he would get a million pounds for us. So I was like, I love him. You know, so that's the same attitude I had about Gaga. And then when I met her, I felt like I met my match, you know, because she got balls. She don't give a damn. She, she writes her music, she produces some of her music, and she comes up with her own concepts, you know, and I do the same thing. So it was, it was almost like a, it was a perfect match, man. When we got in that, on that video set and in the studio, it just was just, it was perfect, man. It was just a natural gelling, you know what I'm saying? We just connected just like that. Really There's also is. a couple of interesting songs off the album like that don't really fit the sex theme. First was My Story. That's the first one you put out yeah. uh, with 2 chains. Why do you feel like that that would be a good introductory to, to this latest project? Well, then again, you know, you know, it, I believe in a full course meal. You know what I'm saying? The meat, the potatoes, <laughs> and the vegetables. You know what I'm saying? Y'all believe in a full course meal? <laughs> Absolutely. They're about to eat soon. <laughs> yeah, and that's metaphors too. So what I'm saying is that... <laughs> saying that is, is that I believe that, you know, my story is setting the record straight first. You know, just let's, let me just set the record straight. You know, this is where I come from. You know what I'm saying? I'm from that shot town dirt. You know what I'm saying? For real. And, uh, and, and to say that, that's like, is you have to have a testimony. And that's what I was talking about earlier. You know, just don't come out and say, dick, pussies, not, nah, like, well, let me fuck you and all that. Now and then just going in. be done with it. But, but you gotta, you gotta give some kind of class or some, here. some kind of, <laughs> Some kind of message first, you know, before you get into it, you know, and then you go on and have fun with the Black Panties album, you know. <laughs> also, one of my favorites in the album is a little song called Shut Up. Now, yeah. shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like you, you met that motherfucker when you recorded that, like. I met a few of them motherfuckers. <laughs> a few of them. No, for people that don't know that, that seems to be the real message to your detractors, you know. 
your big your big statement. Like, mm -hmm. why did that fit? Why did you decide? Like, I mean, obviously you probably felt the passion to record that record. Mm -hmm. Why did you feel like it still fit the project and it, it should be released and, and shared? Well, with first bro? of all, let me tell y'all, man. I did three hundred and sixty-two songs for the Black Panties album, wow. and it took me a long, long time. It took me about a month. Three hundred and sixty-two. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me. Wayne and, and, and Divine Stevens got together, and that was the hardest task of the whole project is breaking down what songs we were going to do. And once we finally got to it, it was between Shut Up and another song. And the reason I chose Shut Up is, Shut Up is because, uh, you know, my surgery and the whole thing, I went through, you know, the 60, uh, 30 some stitches in my throat. I had an abscess on my lung and everything from singing and straining and this, that, and the other, man. And then, you know, I started hearing all of the rumors about he ain't got it no more. He ain't, Kells is old. Even some celebrities out there was talking shit, you know, but it's all good. I, I said to myself, I said to myself, I was, I ain't gonna lie, I was mad. So I went in the studio after the doctor told me don't go in the studio for at least two weeks and let your voice rest. But right after I got out the hospital, after being in there for nine days, I went in and that's the first song came out of my mouth was Shut Up. So I said, this song got to go on the album, man. It's crazy. You know, no, I think yeah. a lot of people didn't really know that how serious the throat surgery situation was. Like, how, how scary was that? How tough was that going through that situation? It was scary as hell for me because, you know, I, I, I knew the pain I was in, you know what I'm saying? Because that Love Letter tour, and I'm going to tell you, I believe what did it was the Love Letter tour. I do all of these songs, man. I go through my whole catalog almost on stage. And then the last song will be like, when a woman love, and I have to hit that note for a long yeah. time. And man, and it would just wear me out because I would have to go up over the fact that I'm hoarse from singing all of the other songs, you know, from yeah. the Stephen Name Love, I Believe I Can Fly, all of those songs that's hard to sing. So, and you can't just mess around when you're singing with a woman's love. That's one of them Jackie Wilson songs. You better wail. Every yeah. night you gotta wail. So, and I did, but I was feeling the pain from it. And then something just popped one night, you know, yeah. during the last leg of the tour. So what was that process? You went to the doctor? Went to the hospital, and uh, I collapsed, actually, at a party, or after party, after the last show. And uh, woke up in the hospital, you know, and uh, hey, they had already done the surgery. Wow. On my throat, I had a big abscess on my lungs, whatever, you know what I'm saying? But I'm back, you know, and it sounds really sharp. good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Around, that, around that same time, you had dropped your book, Solar Coaster. I don't know if anybody yeah. read your book. Yeah. And people were very impressed with your book because you were very candid. You talked about your childhood. You broke a lot of things down uh -huh. that people had heard certain candidates. Like, obviously, very much a focal point of your life is your relationship with your mother, uh -huh. the close bond with your mother. Like, uh -huh. for people that don't know, how did that really develop? Like, you know, you guys, you know, you went through a lot together, you and yeah. your moms. Well, you know, mom is mom if you're a mama's boy. Mom is who she is if you're a mama's boy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm a mama. I would, like consider myself as a mama's boy. And uh, coming up, me and my mother would go to McDonald's every day and 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 uh, have a Danish and coffee together. And uh, which is the reason why I go to McDonald's a lot. You ju you guys don't know. I've written a lot of the hits that y'all love in the parking lot of a McDonald's. <laughs> For real. And I'm gonna tell you why because. I was so close to my mom when I was 16, we'd go into McDonald's and we would always talk about how famous I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be famous, buy our houses and do all of this stuff for her and this, that, and the other. And she would take the coffee and she would make our coffee. We would split a cup of coffee because that's what we could afford is coffee in a Danish. And so she would take the coffee and taste it first, but she wore this cheap red lipstick, you know what I'm saying? And when she tasted it, the lipstick be all around the thing, but I loved her so much that I would actually drink from it and I could taste the lipstick and the coffee. It was crazy, but it was, you know, I, I really had love for her and I respected her because she'd sing, I'd sing, and, and that's just what it was. But when she passed, to get over and whenever, whenever I want to feel the spirit of her, you know, I'd go to a McDonald's parking lot and sit my ass there. I'd be in a Lamborghini just sitting in McDonald's <laughs> like, like this, you know what I'm saying, with a cup of coffee in my hand. So. I would get inspired to write, like, really, seriously, a lot of the songs that you guys hear today. Even now to this day. Even now to this day till I die. Yeah. Because she, she passed right before 12 play, right? She yeah, right she, before 12. She got a chance to see you be a star, but not the superstar that, that, yeah. you, that you have become. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I believe that, baby. I believe that. Yeah.
Yeah. Obviously, another woman that was important in your life was, was your, was your uh, music teacher. Lena McLean, yeah. Lena McLean. She was like, I tell everybody, she was like my Mrs. Minyagi, and I was her Danielson when it came to learning and, and, and listening. And, <laughs> Mrs. Minyagi, your yeah, Danielson. Absolutely. I miss that, yeah. Yeah, man, it's all good. Because she just, taught you like opera, the whole like proper way to sing. Yeah, she, she told me that I was, when I was just really interested in basketball, that, that she said, you're going to be one of the greatest, most prolific writers of our time. And and, and, and I was like 16, 17. I thought she was crazy. I hadn't wrote not one song. And uh, when she told me this, I was really trying to play basketball on the team in high school, you know. And um, and when she told me that, she made me put on glasses and sing and, and all kinds of stuff. And girls was going up in the classroom. I'm like, whoa, I don't get this feeling on the court. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is some, some new shit here. So what's the, what is this all? I'm trying to see what this is about. You know, so... <laughs> And from there, man, it just, I got inspired. It was like being bit by the spider, you know. I wanted, I, I became Spider-Man some kind of way musically, you know what I'm saying? So, and uh, I've been chasing that hit ever since. Yeah. So how did you become a street performer? Because obviously those, those, those tales are the stuff of legend of how you used to... Well, I became a street performer because, for one, school wasn't working for me. I wasn't a reader. I wasn't a writer. I don't write anything down. I don't spell. I don't uh, do math or anything like that. Or Everything was like Chinese arithmetic to me when it came to that. So pretty much after high school, it was like, whoa, what am I going to do? But I knew I had this gift that Miss McGlynn and my mom had instored in me. I said, I got to do something with this. I ain't got no choice. I got to make it. I got to do something. I got to go somewhere. So I hitchhiked to L.A. Man, I'm talking fast as hell. Now we're here. Tell Cal's man. I hitchhiked, I hitchhiked to L.A. You know what I'm saying? You I hitchhiked lived, to L.A.? Yeah, okay, yeah. And I, and I, and I uh, street performed. First I did it in Chicago. I lived in Chicago, so I street performed there. But I wanted the opportunity, so I hitchhiked to L.A. I lived on Venice Beach for about a good three or four months. I ain't talking about a house. I'm talking about the sand part. Okay. And so you had just, never been out get there. Get that straight. Right? Yeah, you had never been out there. You didn't even know what that was. Right? No, yeah. man. No. So I lived out there, but it, that didn't work. I ended up back in Chicago, and uh, uh, I did a barbecue backyard uh, performance with MGM when we was just a new group, and Wayne Williams happened to be back there from Jive Records. And uh, he saw us dancing and performing and things like that, and we did a dance performance. Next thing you know, he brought Jive in. I had management at the time, and, and before you know it, man, I was I was on a, a, a video to do, singing Vibe, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and that led to public announcement because you was in yeah. a group. Like people forget yeah. R. Kelly in the public announcement. Yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so th those wasn't the MGM guys. Those were different guys. Like why yeah. was it? Why would they put you in a group format out the gate? No, what what happened is I did that. I wanted I didn't want to come out just let like a just one guy singing songs. You know, it was that felt boring to me. I, I just I didn't know, but I wanted to feel like I was in a group. Except I went and hired three dancers, and I would choreograph what they would do behind me, and we would all <laughs> chime in together, and uh, and it, so it, I could look like I'm in a group. You know, and it was more ex it was more exciting. You know, so what we were clear on who the lead was. Well, exactly, yeah. I was the Beyonce. So, on that male shit, you know what I'm saying? So, I like kind of set the whole little scene up. You know, I said I ain't worried about it. They gon' they gonna know who I am because I'm gonna be doing the solos songs, and then I'm gonna be you know out front a lot. You know, and, and I, I do all my backgrounds on the track, and the guys they didn't really sing, so they would but they would do the dancing. I would choreograph. Free, those guys got a free ride, man. That was yeah. A so you know, but only thing is we broke up. We end up breaking up because a lot of them start feeling like they were. It was somebody. Still, they were so more than what they were, and uh, wanted to split the money straight down the middle. And that was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> ching ching backwards. <laughs> <laughs> so the first early hits was what? She's got that vibe, honey love. Like, yeah. how did you? When did you first feel like I got a hit record? Like this feel like th like the, your dreams are true. You have a hit record. When did you first feel like that? that I have a hit record. Well, I went to it's a it's a place called Evergreen Mall. It's the Hood Mall in Chicago. We call it Ever Black. Okay, <laughs> so. We call it the hood mall. We go to Ever Black, and we all used to hang out at this mall. It's a very popular mall where everybody went. All the thugs, all the women was up there. You want to you know, meet a girl, go to Ever Black. It's, it'd be jumping up there at that mall. So that was the hangout spot. We go up there, you know, and uh, Vibe came out, and I said, man, I can't wait to go to Ever Black, boy. It's going to be off the chain. They're going to know me, my video out. But then I went up there, and, you know, nobody knew me. I'm walking through there with my homies, and ain't nobody saying nothing. So I, uh, 
I go in, I say, I'm going to go in the ladies' store. I'm going to go in the women's store. So I went in the woman's store, you know, the women, you know, they looking at clothes. So I would go up to this girl, like, looking at clothes and be like, Vines, 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 you got the Vines. <laughs> so she wouldn't say shit. I'm like, damn. So I called Wayne up. I said, Wayne, what's up, dog? These motherfuckers don't know me, man. You said they was going to know my name everywhere. Man, I've been out four weeks. And they don't know me. I said, man, you got to be patient, man. You got to be patient. You know, let it keep going. Let it flow. They're going to know you. Just keep on going, you know. So, but when Honey Love came out, shit, I said, man, let's go to the mall, y'all. And me and my homies, we went to the mall. And, uh, man, I got chased about that motherfucker. I'm like, God damn. I'm running. Wayne, it's on, baby, it's on. These motherfuckers chase me out of here. You know what I'm saying? So that's when I knew I arrived, you know, straight up. And then, so then at least the 12 play at that point, right? You get to go solo. Those guys are acting up. They think they yeah. deserve the money. Yeah. So you, you said, like, I think we said you was on a tour with Levert, and that's when the 12 play concept came to you. Like, yeah, like, yeah. What was special about that that made it connect? Uh, it was Glenn Jones. And Glenn, just show me. Huh, yeah. Show me Glenn Jones. Yeah, yeah, show me what I gotta do. Yeah, Glenn Jones and Levert and me. And I was uh, the opener. And I was like, wow, when I get to the stage, it's like opening the show for Gerald Levert and Glenn Jones, he had a single out then. I would come out on stage and it would be like people coming in with their popcorn and ain't paying attention. I'm like, man, it's like empty seats. This ain't working, man. This is, I need people to see my show, you know. So I was like, what can I do to really just make these people know me and do something different? So I'm on the tour bus, you know, and I'm writing. I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to say something like, okay, yeah, y'all, I had a dream. Uh, I had sex with Mary J. Blige. My guys were like, no, nah, don't say that shit. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. And I said, well, why not? They gonna go up if I say that, you know what I'm saying? Cause they gonna be like, what? I know he didn't just say that. So I said, man, I'm gonna say it. So I said it and I was like, and instead of four play, I had like, it was like 12 play with her. Y'all y'all wanna hear how it go? And they was like, yeah. And I said, all right, this had when? It went, one, we'll go to my room of fun. And the whole crowd said, two. And I knew I was on to something right there. <laughs> now I said, give me a tongue. And then that's just how, it was a skit yeah, yeah. for my show. And before you knew it, long story short, the skit blew up on the show to the point that the promoter put me after Glenn Jones. Glenn wow, Jones went up. first. I done moved up. I done moved on up. And so, but when I moved up, Gerald Vert, they took my lights away. They didn't give me no, you know. Uh, little, I can't remember you know, that. Yeah, it was like I was like, so I went backstage. I was like, Gerald, man, can I get? I mean, my they, they took my smoke machine. <laughs> I had a little smoke machine come out like a little smoke. You can't I, take a brother's smoke. Yeah, don't take away. my smoke, dog. And then what happened to the lights? It looked real dim on stage around me. What's going on? You know. He said, young fella, you got to pay your dues, baby. You got to pay your dues. But what it was, 12 Play was killing their ass every night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dog. <laughs> 12 Play, so, you know. 12 Play. Yeah. One of the defined most 12 Play is Bump and Grind, obviously. Yeah. When did you go with Sitchin, like, speaking of acapella, to come into the track acapella, like, the beginning of that, so classic. Like, when did, you, when did that idea come in the studio? To, like, oh, Bump and Grind? It, yeah. My mind's telling me no. I yeah. won't sing it. That's your job. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but there's, there's magic in that. Oh, they want that? They want that? <laughs> that might hurt stuff. That might hurt stuff. My mind's telling me no. But my body, my body's telling me yes. Baby, I don't want to hurt nobody. But there is something that I must confess. Hey, Kels, you think right here, baby? But that's not even his favorite, though. I saw, like, I, was, I watched one of the late night shows you did. You said. It seems like you're ready's your favorite, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
And then, and then you started to, you started to tell a story about it, but you didn't finish the story, so I was confused. Like, but you said you couldn't tell it on television. So, right, right, could you right. tell the story to us, like how it seems like you're ready came together? That's the idea of that song. She's ready right now. Uh, seems like you're ready. That's my favorite song because that was the first. That was that was my first time I had like three girlfriends at the same time, and they was in the studio with me while I was writing. Seemed like you're ready. I couldn't say that on TV. Oh, okay, but, okay. But that's 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 how it seemed like you ready came about. They was in the lab. They were in the lab. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. how did you feel to the, from that was nineteen ninety three twelve play you dominated from ninety four, and then you came out with R Kelly nineteen ninety five. Yeah. Did you feel pressure like following up twelve play? Like what was your mind state when you first started recording the next album? Like what were you going through at that time? Well, I wasn't pressured at all, man. I, back then, I was so charged, man, because the fans had taken to me. They was like, you know, Kells everywhere, you know, and uh, hands down. And I was starting to be called King R&B or this or that. I'm like, man, I can't wait to get back in the studio. You know what I'm saying? So I just stayed hungry, man, you know? And then we talk about you come up with these really metaphors for everything. It really begins with you remind me of something. You remind me of my Jeep, which yeah, is the lead yeah. single off there, like. Mm -hmm. How did that? How did that idea come about? Uh, you remind me of my Jeep. Um, I re I remember being in the studio, and back then, you know, all, it was a lot of Jeeps out. You know, it was like everybody was riding it was a car Jeeps. Of you know, it was yeah, a ride of man, choice. the Hummers and all of that stuff. You know, and uh, just because of that, I wanted to incorporate that into a song. You know, and the only way I could do it is just you know simply just get in there, do the track first, and and uh, and, and, the, and the first thing I came up with. You remind me of something. I just can't think of what it is. And then it's like, pew, pew, pew. You remind me of my G. I want to ride it. Something like my sound. I want to pump it, baby. That came out, man. It was like... It was like a lot of fun right now, man. Because of, yeah, that's when the metaphors was really going hard. Yeah. You know, with me. <laughs> but now... But now in your metaphors, you brought a whole new thing that launched the whole other brand with Down Low. You brought, you reinvented Ronald Isley as Mr. Biggs. Yeah, yeah. How yeah. did that come about? Because like, there's a lot of new generation that didn't even know the Isley brothers. Like, they know him as Mr. Biggs now. Like, right. the power of that. Like, how did that whole, whole idea come together? I did it in Chicago, uh, in the studio, in Jive Records Studio, uh, downtown. Uh, came up with down low, but it was missing something to me, and it felt like the, the Isley Brothers straight off the bat, of course. And uh, I was like, man, I ain't never met no Ronald Isley. I probably would never meet him, but it, you know, but this feels like him. So I started trying to sing it like him, and it was magical because I was in L.A. doing billboards, and I saw Ronald Isley shopping on Sunset or one of those one of those shopping places, and I said, Ronald Isley, R. Kelly, man. Hey, Kelly, how you doing, man? I love your music, <laughs> man. How are you? I said, man, let me tell you something, man. I got a song that will change your very life. If you just sing on it for a minute, I'm telling you. Oh, right, good, Kelly, get it to me. You know, it's all good. You know, I said, right, whatever, whatever, you know. I got on the album, man. I mean, the song. And uh, he came, he ended up coming to Chicago. Uh, because you know, not that he wasn't singing it right, but I had a new, fl I had like a new flow, you know, yeah. and uh, so I wanted him to sing it in my flow, in the way I do it. So he came to Chicago and did it. Followed the Yellow Brick Road on that, and uh, and it just came off hot, man. And next thing you know, Mr. Biggs was born, baby. A little bit after that, you made the record. This is your Grammy Award winning, I believe I could fly. Mm -hmm. You know, like obviously that's a special record. That's like a record that like. You know, people people play like kids singing junior high school, high school, blah blah. Mm -hmm. But what I thought was interesting, like as powerful the record was, when reading your book, you had said that you had played an early version for Notorious B.I.G. Biggie Smalls. Yeah, heard yeah, of it. yeah, Is that absolutely. true? Like talk that's about very that. true, man. You know, first of all, Michael Jordan, we was play, Michael Jordan was for his movie, this, yeah, Space yeah, Jam, he, yeah. He would play in this gym that we go to, and he'd come in every now and then and play with us. You know, so he came in and uh, we was playing basketball, and I was playing against him. True story. I ripped the ball from him. I come from behind and ripped the ball. Yeah, I oh, okay. ripped the ball from Mike. 
Kells with the steal. What? Kells with the steal. <laughs> so I ripped the ball from Mike, man, and I'm I'm on my way. I'm going the other way. I'm finna lay it up, and he smacked the damn ball into wow. the oh, into the bleachers. I thought I left him. But he smacked the ball into the bleachers, and I felt really bad, really embarrassed. It was all good. But at the end of the day, that's the day he asked me to do uh, a song for his movie coming out. You know, so when one thing led to another. I did. I was in Detroit on tour with Biggie, and I, I was in the lobby, in the hotel lobby, after the show and everything. And I was, yeah, I know, I know. I know. After the show was the... I started hearing it too. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> So, but true story, I was sitting at this piano that I got them to unlock in the lobby. So, and then Biggie came in about 30 minutes later because I woke up hearing the song, I Believe I Can Fly. And he said, what's up, B? You know, he came down, I said, man, check this out, check this out. So he sat down with me and I started, I used to think that I could not go on. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. I started doing a little bit of that. He said, oh, baby, that's a hit. That's a hit, baby. You know, and we was just sitting there discussing it, you know, but then I went into the studio eventually and finished it. Yeah. Grammy Award winner. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man.